students, faculty, parents, and families, honored guests, welcome to the commencement ceremony for the class of 2021 at Providence Classical Christian Academy. Today, we are overjoyed to recognize the achievements of the nine seniors graduating this year and invite you to join us in this day of celebration. It is with great joy that the faculty and families look back on the years of study you have spent here at Providence. We praise the Lord for the fine <clears throat> men and women that you have become and grown up to be. At Providence, we celebrate not only the academic accomplishments of each of these students, but the many ways in which the Lord has planted seeds of truth, goodness, and beauty in your lives with the hope that the Lord will continue to work in and through each of you for his glory and for the good of the world. Our efforts to that end would never achieve the full measure of our vision for graduates at Providence merely by our labors or by our strength alone, but they require the blessing of the Lord upon each day of learning and growing. May God pour out his blessing upon our exercises today and may he be pleased with our celebration. Please join me now in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, please be exalted in this day as we reflect the exalted Christ who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. It is now my honor to welcome to the podium our salutatorian and valedictorian for 2021. Both of these students, in their own way, exemplify the wisdom, virtue, and eloquence with which we strive to equip each and every one of our students. They have taken up many roles in student leadership in and for the school, and we are grateful for their years here and the investment and impact that they have made on the school in their time not only as seniors, but as high school, middle school, and many of them grammar school students. I now will call forward our salutatorian, Andrew Vastola, to give a salutatory speech, and then he will be followed by our valedictorian, Heidi Bosch, giving a valedictory speech. As the salutatorian, I have the honor of once again welcoming you all to tonight's graduation for the senior class of 2021. And I would like to first thank all the people who have made this possible for my class and I. Thank you to the teachers, faculty, and administrators over the years who devoted themselves to educating us and bringing to life Providence's vision of wisdom, virtue, and eloquence. Thank you to all my friends and peers who have graduated, are yet to graduate, and are graduating with me now for making Providence a place that I could return to year after year as if it were home. And finally, thank you to my parents who spent the money to send me here and have supported me tirelessly for all 13 years of my education at this school. 13 years is a long time for someone my age. And I must admit, it is rather surreal to be standing up here giving a speech, let alone graduating. When I was a kid in grammar school, I always knew that I would graduate from Providence, but that seemed to be such a foreign, far off concept. Now that concept is a reality for my class and I, and it feels as if everything happens so quickly. I stand back and think, that's it then? What now? I easily forget that we still have our whole lives in front of us, that in the grand scheme of things, high school is just a blip on the radar, an event on the timelines that are our lives. High school does not define us, just as it did not define, nor will define, anyone else in this room. However, the marvelous thing about high school is that it takes place during some of the most formative years of our lives. We graduate it and are released into the world no longer wearing our training wheels. This means that where we go to high school and what we do there still matters, which is why I admire Providence, especially for its focus on classical education. However, it took me a long time to fully appreciate what the classical education does here. I still remember reading Socrates' definition of justice in Plato's Republic in 10th grade and not thinking much of it at the time. Now in senior year, I believe it's the best definition of justice I've seen 
and can apply it to real world situations. I remember learning about the way to achieving true, achieving true happiness through virtue and not fortune's gifts and becoming quickly tired of hearing of it. Now I wholeheartedly believe that combined with Christ, there is no better argument for true happiness. These are just a couple examples of many, but they illustrate the point that providence and its classical education not only release you into the world, but they prepare you for the world. Now don't get me wrong, I've been here long enough that I've seen the bad as well as the good, but I'm glad that I've seen both. See, much like Pimlico in G.K. Chesterton's book Orthodoxy, providence is not measured by the views or critiques of people looking onwards from the outside. No, it has value because it is beloved by the people within it who see the good and the bad and appreciate it for what it is. I'm not merely invested in providence because of its virtues, but also because of its flaws. I look at its flaws and I want it to be better. I know it can be better, and I trust that it will be better. So I exhort my fellow peers who have yet to graduate to take advantage of what is in front of you. And not only take advantage of the education given to you at Providence, but do what Mrs. Stoner always used to tell us and leave it better than you found it. To get the most out of your experience at Providence, you have to truly partake in it. Be willing to put yourself out there and be a fool, even if it means you think you'll look uncool in the eyes of others. Be like those three unnamed fools who on the way down to the Joplin basketball tournament in their freshman year began writing a ridiculous play script to a Greek tragedy, all because they were reading Greek tragedies with Mr. Duvier in literature class. That being said, I acknowledge that along the way, there will be things that you don't like about Providence. There were certainly things that I had gripes yet about, but don't just sit idly by and complain about them. Use the opportunity to address those issues, whatever they may be, and leave Providence better than you found it. To conclude, I'm going to quote the famous passage from Theodore Roosevelt's Citizenship in a Republic speech, which I've found applicable throughout my life, and especially so in this moment. It reads, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who, at the worst, if he fails, at least fails daring greatly, so that his place shall never be among those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. week, my aunt jokingly asked me if I was going to write a speech about the magic of following your dreams. And maybe if I went to a different school, I would have. But having read Boethius, I plan to talk about something completely different. Many speeches call for graduates to rise to the top and not stop until they've reached the pinnacle of greatness. They call graduates to make a name for themselves, to reach powerful positions, and to accumulate wealth. However, one of our class's favorite books has something completely different to say on this matter. Boethius was a 6th century Roman consul and philosopher who was imprisoned and executed by the king of the Ostrogoths for charges of conspiracy. While in prison, he wrote The Consolation of Philosophy, where he said, Nothing is miserable unless you think it so. And on the other hand, nothing brings happiness unless you are content with it. Boethius did not believe a fame, power, or wealth could bring lasting happiness to life if they were pursued for their own value. One would always be left wanting more. Instead, he believed contentedness was the source of lasting happiness. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, Paul writes, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul was able to be content in all circumstances. He was able to experience the true happiness which Boethius references because of Christ who is working in him, giving him joy. My fellow graduates, I sincerely believe that you all should strive for and will achieve great things. You may have power, you may have wealth, and you may have fame. God will use you in amazing ways to fulfill his purposes on earth. But I want to call you to be joyful in your journey, content through the different stages of life, through the power of Christ who gives you strength. For students enrolled at Providence, this is a call to value the gift that this school is. 
Although it is easy to get lost in the monotony of each day or be blinded by stress, don't let routine cause you to miss the dedication of the people who are pouring into you every day. Don't miss the teachers who give up so much, driving cars that barely work, even working extra jobs, to be able to pass on the things that they believe are important for your life. Don't miss your parents who make sacrifices of time and money to send you to a school where they believe you will succeed and grow as a person. Providence is one of the greatest gifts I've ever received, and looking back, I wish I had appreciated it more. In light of this, I would like to thank some of the teachers who have made our upper school years the amazing and memorable experience that they were. Mr. Dace, thank you for teaching us about the amazing diversity and order in creation and awing us with your Fortnite abilities. Providence will miss having you next year. Mr. Duvier, thank you for sharing your passion for ancient history and literature with us. I will never forget the time when you made us charge across Virgil so that we would get a better understanding of how the Greek hoplite warriors felt at Marathon. I will also take your dating um, advice to heart and make sure all my future boyfriends do not have wet fish handshakes. <laughs> Ms. Brewer, thank you for teaching us rhetoric, history, and literature over the years. You put in so much work writing your own textbooks to make everything understandable. I will never forget the time you tried to bribe us to go to sleep at retreat by singing Apple Bottom Jeans. I'm pretty sure it didn't work. Sorry about that. <laughs> Mrs. Bliss, thank you for teaching us math through the years and being patient even when we felt like checking our calculus books at the wall. Thank you for always checking in and asking us how our weekends were even when you got only vague and very sleepy answers. Mrs. Rodlowski, thank you for teaching us chemistry freshman year and being so invested in us that you invited us to your house for the cool chemistry cookout. Mr. Matul, thank you for teaching us Greek and causing us to learn more about the churches and doctrines and practices in theology. However, I am not thankful and never will be thankful for the habanero pepper challenge. <laughs> and Mr. Buckles, thank you for teaching us literature, rhetoric, and logic through the years. Thank you for always being so kind and for bringing us donuts and chocolate milk on check day. <laughs> and Mr. Keating, thank you for your instruction and counsel throughout the years, from coaching basketball to teaching us history and how to engage with hard questions in theology. Your investment and care into each of your students has changed our lives for the better. I would also like to thank my class for all the last care and forgiveness they have given me and each other over the years. I have immense love and respect for every one of you, and I'm very excited to see what God has in store for your lives. And finally, I would like to thank my parents. Mom and Dad, thank you for sending me to Providence. Thank you for cheering me on through every struggle I face. Thank you for encouraging me, guarding me, and protecting me. Because of the love you have given me, I am able to start to get an understanding of how my Heavenly Father loves me. Thank you to all the parents and mentors of this graduating class for all the sacrifices along the way that have led us to where we are. And finally, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. He said, it's not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that brings true happiness. Thank you both for those lovely and encouraging speeches. We would now like to welcome to the stage our keynote speaker for the class of 2021, Mr. Matul. As many of you know, uh, Mr. Matul has been with Providence for many years, serving as our headmaster for several years uh, after serving as a teacher and now still continues to serve as a teacher in our upper school. Uh, our students have selected him as their speaker uh, for he was their headmaster for many years, and of course, as was mentioned, their Greek and theology teacher last year. Mr. Matul uh, still continues to teach 11th grade theology and 10th grade rhetoric for us, and now commits himself vocationally uh, as the pastor of Sovereign Grace Presbyterian Church, uh, where he has been the pastor for quite a while, uh, but now is able to focus his full attention. And we are blessed to have him back here with us this evening to hear from him uh, and the seniors as well to hear the special message he has for each of you. Please welcome Mr. Matul. Well, special mes message may be stretching it a little bit, 
However, I am comforted by the two preceding speakers that I don't have to worry about not being cool. And as far as wealth accumulation goes, I'm fulfilling that right now. So very grateful for that. As far as conspiracy theories go, there was one that didn't take root the past year that the whole national and international shutdown was closely aligned with our approaching the subjunctive case or mood. So I'm interested to know what strings you have with international affairs to call down all the shutdown. But in all seriousness, it is a great privilege to be here this evening and we have the awkward moment of where do I look? Do I look at you as you're looking at me or at the graduates who will now have an ache in their neck? And we're grateful for that as well and happy to see the smiles uh, tonight. Well, your life has been full of imposing claims. You have heard a lot about you must, this is necessary, and you ought to. And if you think that's going to stop or slow down, it's not going to, it's going to continue. You'll have that at school if you're going on to school. You'll have that in the military. You'll have that in life if the Lord calls you to singleness, if the Lord calls you to marriage. You'll have many musts and necessary commitments. Upon closer inspection, though, most things that come to us with a you must actually often has an asterisk next to it. And it's something that is typically relative to another a desire. You must exercise. Well, there's an asterisk next to that if you want to be a bit healthier. You must eat better. Again, there's the asterisk. You don't have to eat better, actually. You can eat as much as you want of anything you want. There will be consequences. You must, in getting a bit more serious, of course, study well. You must choose a good school. You must choose the right person to marry, if that's the, what you're going to do. Of course, at 18, you're qualified to vote. And you'll get the picture of every recurring four years that you must vote because now it is the most important election in our nation's history. That is something that will not change. And with the advent of social media today and whatever else is coming, you will feel that must and ought and necessity with all the more force. And you must make your voice heard. Everything is a must. Even this past year, we've had this new idea of there are some businesses which are essential and necessary and others that aren't. Don't worry, I'm not going to go political here, apart from the moment, no. Um, the idea is you must obtain, you have to do these things. Of course, we can get closer to needs and necessities. Christ tells us that if you have food and drink and clothing with these to be content, and so we get closer to what is necessary. And yet, there's a time when your body will fail and you won't have the ability to digest your food and other such things, which raises a question about, is there something of even greater importance? You must cultivate, the society tells you, the right style, the right friends, the right image on social media. If you want to be a high reviewer of certain fast food restaurants, make sure that you write your reviews with great intake and get support from others about the neighboring Burger King. So all of these things you must do and some of you have done. If you want to win a prize, eat the most habanero peppers without drinking the milk set before you. And for those of you who don't want to, you get to laugh at them. So there's a lot of musts. Well, I don't wish to panic parents, or doctors or teachers or anyone for that matter, but I'd like to contend that most of these necessities are necessary, sort of. I don't only mean that the right image and the right health is necessary, sort of. I mean all of it. I mean having the right spouse is sort of necessary. I mean having the right job is sort of necessary. I mean giving yourself to various callings in this life is sort of necessary. I don't mean to denigrate them. I don't mean to say that they're unimportant. But the scriptures tell us that there's not many necessities, but there's one thing necessary. Of all of the graduation speeches that have been given, that I've attended, and that I've given, I don't remember much. 
I do remember one thing that was mentioned already, that you're to leave it better than you found it. If I'm not mistaken, that was as a, as a sixth grade graduation. But I wish you to remember one thing this evening, that there is one thing that's necessary. When you walk onto your college campuses, you'll have a lot of prerequisites that are necessary if you wish to advance in a certain subject. You'll have the necessity of making friends and developing uh, various relationships. All of these things have the appearance of something being necessary. But I want you to hear to a short passage from the scriptures found in Luke. We find Mary and Martha, and it speaks of Martha receiving Jesus into her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter therefore that she help me. If we pause there for a moment, I want you to imagine that scene. That there you are, busily giving yourselves to something that's good, hospitality. And there is your sister, your brother, your friend, that's just sitting down. Wouldn't that be a bit infuriating? And this is what she comes and says, make her help me. And Jesus says this, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. She was anxious and troubled about a lot of things that were good. You will be anxious and tempted to be troubled about many things that are good. But listen to what Christ says next. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, When you put that in context and think for just a moment, Christ is saying that of all of even the good and best things, there's only one thing that is needful. It's not sitting down, by the way, although she's sitting at Jesus' feet. That's a posture that's exemplifying something. It's testifying something. It's saying that she's a disciple. She's learning of Christ. She's listening to his promises. She's listening to his commandments. She's giving him honor and glory. And she is giving herself to denying herself, taking up her cross, and following him. One thing is needful. If you allow the many voices of this world to tell you that there are many things which are needful, you'll find yourself anxious. Some of you have already experienced that. Some of you have allowed the good things to take on a place in your life that they ought never to have. Does it mean they ought to have no place? By no means. But it does mean they're to have second place at best, and most likely third or fourth place. You will be tempted as you go even to Christian gatherings to put other things ahead of your being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I wish for this to be drilled into your head. That as Christ says, there is one thing needful, one thing that's necessary, one thing that is a must, Nothing else. Tomorrow is not a must apart from your being a disciple of Christ. Your recessing out of here is not a must apart from your being a disciple of Christ. Your graduating college is not a must. Your getting a spouse is not a must. Your having children is not a must. Your being faithful as a person who's single is not a must in and of itself apart from it being an expression of your being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. This means to sit at Christ's feet. It's not the equivalent of simplifying the Christian life to what would Jesus do. It's rather a taking in of all that Jesus is and teaches and promises and commands. That you're to sit at his feet not just as he gives his commandments, but you're to sit at his feet when he speaks pardon and peace. You're to sit at his feet when he encourages you when the world turns its back on you. You're to sit at his feet when you've done what's right and the one who's done what's wrong is the one who's honored. You're to sit at his feet to gain consolation from him. 
You're to sit at his feet to hear his words of promise and grace and to receive them by faith when all else by sight says otherwise. You're to sit at his feet when you have to suffer. All of you have suffered somewhat in this life already, some far more significantly than others, and some of you have known what it is to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and yet to know the presence of the Lord. You know what it is when there are enemies surrounding you to sit, as it were, at the table he's prepared, and it seems there to be only your seat and his. But you also have this assurance that as the psalm goes on to testify, that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Now think of this for a moment. You will dwell in the house of God forever. Do you know one thing that will never change? It's being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else will change. It's a difficult thing to think of. Your parents will shudder at the thought. Some of you within five years will be married. Some of you within 10 years will have children. Some of you may, within that same 10 years, lose dear loved ones that are here in this room. Some of you will have children that you may have to bury. Life in front of you is difficult. The only one who is able to sustain you in the midst of those trials is the one who is worthy of your complete and absolute consideration of his claim as the one thing needful. She chose the good part, which shall not be taken from her. Do you realize that everything else will be taken from you in one way or another? Your spouse will be taken from you someday. Your life will be lost someday. Your learning will amount to nothing someday. And yet Christ will never be taken from you. Not at the end of this life, not a thousand years into the future, not a million years into heaven. And still then, you will find what it is to sit at his feet, giving glory to him, casting your crowns before him, and rejoicing that he brought you to be his disciple. Do you remember when Christ had many depart from him? He turned to Peter and said, will you also go away? Do you remember what Peter said? He said, you have the words of eternal life. Where else would we go? Will you keep that with you? Not just tonight, not just in the moment when you have to look at me, not just in the moment when you have to hear me. Will you remember that tomorrow when you wake up and you have the freedom of a Saturday that doesn't have studies in front of it? Will you remember that a year from now? I hope that of this evening you take one thing with you. But there's one thing in front of your life that's needful. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who has the words of eternal life that to cleave to him though all else forsake him is the greatest wisdom because you've chosen the one thing that will never be taken from you. The Lord bless you as you walk with him, as you deny yourselves, as you trust in him, as you know what it is to find your tears wiped by his hand, as you know what it is to rejoice with him as he gives you mercy as he accompanies you all the days of your life, may you know the rejoicing of his mercy, not only now, but well into the future, when heaven and earth as we know it is no more, and they are made one at the return of Christ. Thank you, Mr. Matul. It's my honor now to present diplomas of graduation to, to the class of 2021. Please rise, class of 2021. I will call forward by name each individual student who will receive their diploma from the president of the board, Mr. Dan Marcotte, and then will be greeted by our headmaster, Mr. Buckles, myself, and Mr. Jonathan Matul.
Heidi Annette Bosch. Natalie Eliza Hamilton. Mark Cannon Hearn. Nathan Thomas Renner. Kayla Ruth Stout. Andrew Curry Vastola. Emma Catherine Weidler. William Arthur Weidler. Christina Audrey Wooldridge. Class of 2021, you may now move your tassels. <clears throat> it is my great privilege and honor to present the class of 2021.
Now, class, as 2021, as you leave these walls, I give you these six charges. I charge you to be good servants, being increasingly conformed to the model of virtue we see in Christ Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. I charge you to be true scholars, cultivating the virtues of humility and charity in your pursuit of the truth, aspiring to be charitable readers of others, well-rounded men and women, insatiably curious, lifelong learners. I charge you to be beautiful witnesses to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with clear and convicted use of the language God has given us. By God's grace, I charge you to go out into the world as those who seek to peel, peel back the darkness and bring the light of Christ. I charge you to be citizens of God's kingdom, first and foremost, prepared to confront the trials and challenges of life and serve as stewards of the good creation God has entrusted to you, his image bearers, in whatever vocation to which you may be called. I charge you to use your gifts for the good of others, for your families, churches, communities, nation, and world. And finally, I charge you to do these things for God's glory and not your own. Non nobis domine domine, sed tuo da gloria. As we close tonight, I'm going to close us with prayer. Um, after I pray, the upper school choir will perform a final song, and then Mr. Matul will return to the podium to offer us a benediction. Then there will be a recessional uh, at, during which the graduating class and faculty will recess. <clears throat> and uh, after that, during the postlude, uh, the rest of our audience will be dismissed. Uh, at the conclusion of tonight's ceremony, the seniors will gather outside the front of the building to take this, the uh, traditional picture in front of the school sign. And then, of course, after that, the senior tables, as you might have seen as you came in, are displayed in the multi-purpose room uh, right here adjacent to us. And so you're welcome to return to that multi-purpose room to view those tables, uh, to congregate, and there will also be bottled water and some pre-sliced cake. So uh, let's close in prayer, and then we'll listen to one final song. Heavenly Father, we ask for your mighty hand to be on all those who graduate today. Bless their lives with your presence. May you embolden them with your love and power. As your Son, Jesus, has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom, confirm in them this mission, and help them to live the good news we proclaim through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You stand with me and receive the benediction, receiving the Lord's blessing by faith. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. <laughs>